Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered, the place to talk about sex and the people who work in it. Now, today, I have somebody a little bit different. I know that most of you come here for interviews with porn stars, and my guest today is not one, but trust me when I say that you are going to want to stick around because she is a sex and relationship coach who is the definition of unfiltered. She makes videos about everything from making your semen taste better to how to have sex in public, do's and don'ts of orgies, and how to hire escorts. There is no topic too taboo for her to address, which is why I am so excited today to talk to Caitlin B. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. You're so welcome. I'm so glad we could finally make this happen. Yeah, there was a little bit of back and forth. We've had a lot of back and forth. Yes, <laughs> but but you were here today. It was just the universe trying to drum of excitement yes. for your arrival. Yeah, we were edging. <laughs> <laughs> We've been edging for like three months now. Oh, well, I can't wait to explode into <laughs> an amazing episode with you. <laughs> so, um, Caitlin, let's just talk about your background and how you got into sex coaching. Okay, so I knew from like the age of 14 that I was going to talk about sex for a living, that I was going to help people to enjoy sex more for a living. But I grew up in the Midwest. My parents really impressed upon me that I needed to go to college. So I decided to go this like very empirical science route. And I actually became a sexual health researcher. And I was really good at it. And I got totally like stuck in the ivory tower. You know, I like, kept succeeding and succeeding and getting promoted. And the more I got promoted, the less I was actually with people. So the more time I was spending like crunching numbers and publishing papers and I just wanted to be on the ground like talking to people about their sex lives. So I left my doctorate and I started to coach. And pretty quickly after that, I got asked to be part of a YouTube video for someone else's channel where we talked about squirting and that video went viral and that inspired me to start my own YouTube channel. And that was almost eight years ago now. And since then, we've published 400 videos. I have a show on uh, Discovery Plus or on HBO Max called Good Sex, where I coach couples. And it's just been a like roller coaster ever since. And I ended up focusing really on men, which was surprising because as a researcher, I was really focused on women and bisexual women like myself. But on YouTube, because of the squirting video and uh, the, you know, the people who responded to my content on YouTube were mostly men. So mm -hmm. that's what I've been specializing in for the last eight years. Yeah. Amen to that. Mm -hmm. Now, you said that when you were 14, you knew that you were going to spend the rest of your life talking about sex. Yeah. Could you say why? So I figured out how to masturbate really young, mm -hmm. three years old. And so I had this relationship with my body and I knew my body could feel good and it could feel pleasure like well before I knew anything about sex or sexuality. Mm -hmm. And so when I got to high school and I started doing sex ed and they were throwing up pictures of like, you know, genitals with syphilis and they're talking about, you know, unwanted pregnancies and STIs and STDs and all of the risks and the dangers of sex, but none of the pleasures, none of yeah. like the reasons that we have sex and engage in it. Yeah. And I just felt like this is so off, you know? Yeah. And this is not this is not my experience of my own body and certainly wasn't my experience with my partner, my high school boyfriend at the time. Plus, I was like a huge nerd already then. I was studying sex. Like I had my planner and I would keep notes of all the sex that I was having when I started having sex with my high school boyfriend and like positions and orgasms and like wow. I mean, how did he feel about that? I don't know that he knew about all. I mean, I think he was down cuz I was just like I think we should try anal. Here's what I've learned about it. Like he was like game you know? <laughs> yeah. unless he grew up catholic so he was probably like i don't know like it was yeah. Just, yeah like let's go there yeah uh yeah so i i, I just it, it just came by it naturally i just I'm one of those people who came to earth who like was like i know what i'm gonna do and that's, yeah that's that. you knew your path already yeah it just took me a while to figure out exactly what it would be and i'm right. still figuring it out yeah i mean aren't we all yeah so um would you consider what you do to be under the umbrella of like sex work i mean that's kind of like a new term that like a lot of people um, use. I've had people ask me that, like, do you consider yourself a sex worker because you work like in the industry? Like, I don't do porn, but I like right. shoot some nudes for my OnlyFans, and so it's like it's been I like. Don't a, have, oh, you I do. Know, you oh, don't. you do. Oh, I do. You do. Yes, I know. We can't see you naked anywhere online, which you know, it's <sighs> not sad yet. for us. Not but yet. Um, maybe one day. Maybe right one now. Day. No, but yeah. So like, you know, would the you tell people that you? work in sex work? Yeah, it's such a great question. I think about it a lot. Like recently I recorded my first guided masturbation meditation and that is like the most into sex work that I felt that I've mm -hmm. ever gotten. So I think I'm sex work adjacent. Mm -hmm. And I think the distinction that I would make is 
what you do designed to gratify and like get people something to be sexually aroused and get off on and like feel aroused by what I do mostly is educational and transformational but people do get aroused and get off on mm-hmm. people talk to me all the like right all the time about like you know a couple that watches my YouTube videos on mute while they have sex and they're like pretending that they're having a threesome with me or you know I run into people oh, on the compliment. street I know right I, was like, <laughs> I do consent to like thank you for checking in yeah that that feels wholesome and safe for me thank you <laughs> or like I you know I meet people in public who recognize me and like they make this face that I mean I would love to talk to a porn star about this maybe you get this like where mm-hmm. someone recognizes you and you're like oh that person has jacked off to me like their face mm-hmm. like goes like <laughs> you know, I don't really get that. I've get only that? been recognized in public like three times what? my entire career. And one of them was the guy like emailed me afterwards like, I saw you at this so-and-so place. Yeah, I get that place. at I Costco. Like, okay. I saw you at Costco. Um, but uh, yeah, otherwise I don't, at least to the, my knowledge. I mean, obviously if I go to conventions and stuff. I, I'd be curious if they, if you see, if you ever see somebody in public just go like this at you, I think that's the thing. I'm, I'm making some assumptions. I've never stopped that guy and been right. like, hey, um, tell me, how did you recognize me? Yeah. But yeah, I, see, I think sex work adjacent and, and sort of like on the edge of the umbrella. Okay, gotcha. So um, even though you're not a performer, you do talk about sex very openly online. Have you experienced like stigma around what you do for a living? You know, less and less over time. I think one of my gifts is that this all comes extremely naturally to me. Like I said, I knew I was going to do this when I was a teenager. So I think my like my core strength in doing this outside of just that I'm a, a collector of information and like a born researcher is that these subjects don't really feel taboo to me. They don't feel stigmatized. Like I have a lot of individual comfort talking about these things. And I think that like creates a little bubble of safety for other people to talk about it and experience it as well. That said, I have like, you know, I was on a flight to Chicago one time and I told the guy next to me what I did for a living. And he like his whole body tensed up and he literally like threw his cell phone down on the floor of the plane and was like, oh my God, if my wife ever knew that I was talking to you on this flight, she would wonder what I was doing in Chicago. And I was like, dude, like, it's interesting, though, it's, it's plain. like for him, it's more about like, what would his wife say? Right. And like less about what he thinks. Yeah. And that even just by having this conversation that would like taint his entire business trip and make it about sex. And, you know, I, even people that do recognize me, I had a guy recognize me in the grocery store and he was like, oh, my God, I'm sorry for making this awkward. And I was like, dude, no one else here knows why you know me or what I do for a living. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not weird. So I do feel it, but no, like um, my parents, my, my mom, my dad's past, but my mom's been like incredibly proud and supportive. She watched my TV show with my family, you mm-hmm. know, and the show shows people having sex. So like, I was like, if I ever wondered if my mom was supportive, she has my back. Yeah. She's, she's selling that show everywhere she goes. Yeah. yeah. So tell me a little bit about your show. So uh, the concept for Good Sex is I coach couples using bedroom cameras. So we put security cameras in their bedroom that filmed 24-7. And then they would have sex. They would perform different assignments. Like if I asked them to do this or try something, they would go home and do it. And then I would take those clips and use them in my coaching sessions to help them to get better in bed. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about the show is that you know, a lot of what I do, almost everything that I do for for coaching is done over Zoom or over phone call. Like I don't, I'm not with my clients in person and I, I don't get access to like that kind of behind the scenes footage. And I had been doing that for several years before we ever put cameras in anyone's bedroom. And I, I wasn't totally sure if it was going to make that much of a difference. And as soon as I got the first footage back, and you know this because you work on camera, right? Like a video is worth a million words, right? So I was able to really get in and get really specific and give advice that was super tailored because when we're having sex, it is very difficult later to describe that experience, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and I knew this from doing research. I was part of a study where we were trying to like pinpoint the moment that uh, an STD is, is transmitted from one person to another. And when you ask people like, okay, what happened? Like you made out and then this and then the toy came out and the lube came out and then I think we were in missionary and then this and then I don't remember and then she came and like it's a very complicated nuanced thing that's happening to us and it's very difficult to recall. Yeah, because you're like in the moment, hopefully, hopefully right? You're in the moment. Yeah, if you're yeah. tracking it too much, you're probably not having a great time. Either. Right, right. So having the cameras helped me to get beyond what people can describe in words and just go straight to what was actually happening. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting. I don't. When when I was reading about this and about, you know, what you did for your show, 
it made me think about, I don't know if you know this, but I had a show for Playboy TV where I did the same thing, but not. I watched people's at home sex tapes and I critiqued it. However, I didn't critique the sex. I critiqued the um, the visual. Like the filming? The filming, <laughs> yeah. So I would talk about like the lighting. I would talk about the sound. I would talk about the cropping and stuff like that. And then we would bring them in and then I would produce a professional sex tape for them. Maybe we should team up. Yeah. And we could do, because we're bringing like the whole, between both of us, we've got right. the holistic. Yeah. Here's how we could. I will it. say though that like, <laughs> I think that you probably would have been really helpful in that situation because it was um, it was very difficult for the guys to perform mm. on camera under that kind of because they're amateurs, of, right? Like they're not. Yeah, they, they'll want like the rule was that they could never have done any kind of like porn scene before, and a lot of them were swingers, so like they went to parties and they like had sex in front of other people at parties, different. so they thought they could do it completely different experience yeah, yeah and a lot of guys uh would like fail and there was a lot of awkward it was one it was there was a lot of uncomfortable mm-hmm. moments there was a lot of times that i would have to tell people your penis isn't gonna work let's stop pretending that it will right and uh we're gonna shoot it in a way that makes it look like it's working, but it's not. And you and your girlfriend have to pretend Imagine. like you're having great sex right now. Yeah. Even though like both of you are like dying of shame Ugh. in front of all these people. Like it was, it was rough. Yeah. I feel like I might have like destroyed some relationships. You know what I mean? <laughs> it was meant to be. Yeah. You know? I would have loved to be there to, to pull them aside and coach them. And yeah. Like, I mean, I do feel let's like do a breathing exercise. Let's see if we can drop you into your body. Let's back up and try something else. Mm-hmm. I think also too, like there's probably a way to film this that wasn't so, that was more intimate yeah. um, than it was, but it was a fun show. And I had a, a lot of, I am so grateful for the experience. And it's funny cause I still get a lot of people writing to me who, who watch that. it. It was called adult film school, oh, I love but that. the shooting of it was, well, I think people underestimate how much a camera changes everything. Yeah. You know, even just one, let alone a whole set. I think honestly, too, what really got to people was the silence. Mm. Because like when you're at a party, there's lots of people. There's a diff- first of all, a totally different vibe, right? There's yeah. music in the background. People are intoxicated. Yeah. You've you been drinking. There was no, it's dead silent. Yeah. And there's a guy with a boom <laughs> standing over you. Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so, um, yeah. It's so, different. So different. Yeah, but sex kind doesn't of translate same. in all you know, set and setting. No. It, it's not the same everywhere that we go. It's not the same at home as it is at a party as it is on a set. Yeah. So that kind of leads to my question about, um, you know, porn sex, right? So like, is por- so many people want to know, like, is porn sex like real sex? Should I be having sex like a porn star? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean. By and large, if I had to answer that with a single word, I would say no. But there is a lot of variety in porn. So Mm -hmm. like some porn really does look like sex that people at home do have. Mm -hmm. And there's also such a tremendous range of what sex can look like. You know, porn for the most part is really focused on intercourse, right? Because that's what we can see on camera. We can actually like watch body parts Mm -hmm. smashing together, right? But like sex also includes the energetic connection between two people, like the feeling that's going on, the emotional connection, the mental connection between two people. It also includes all of of like the sensual touch and the way that the sheets feel and the way that your hands feel and the the way that we're like touching and grabbing and groping on each other it also includes like the 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 mental aspects of like what are we into what's our connection what's kinky what's taboo about this it it there's so much going on that just can't be visualized. Mm. And so just by consequence of the medium, because we're talking about video and audio here, we have to focus on the things that we can see and hear. And so it misses out on the things that we can feel. And therefore people get way overly focused on what it looks like. Mm. And and they forget about sex is primarily when you're with a lover at home in private and no one's filming, mostly about what it feels like. Yeah. And I think that you know this is why having a wider variety of porn and like opening up people's minds about what sex is is beneficial for everybody. Yeah. That that's so true. I've never had anybody kind of describe it in that way, but that is so incredibly accurate. Yeah. So, um what is the biggest issue that the couples you coach deal with when it comes to their sex lives? Mm. You know, it's funny because 
we I hang like sex is the sign outside of my door, right? And people come to me because that's the thing that is obviously going haywire when they come to me, right? Like it's very easy to pinpoint. Again, we can see it. My, the evidence is that I'm not getting hard. She's not orgasming. Sex hurts. We want to have sex uh, at different times or one of us wants it more frequently than the other. But all of it kind of comes down to what people have self-diagnosed as sexual incompatibility or dysfunction. Uh, you know, the case with like erectile dysfunction or, or premature ejaculation. But actually what tends to be going on underneath is a lack of self-knowledge. Like people don't really know what works for them, what really turns them on, why they really are getting turned up. Like they have an idea of what it is, but th they don't actually have the the education or the awareness or the wherewithal to Or they actually... feel ashamed about it and they don't want to talk oh, about it. Oh my God. It. Or they can't separate that from the way that they were raised or the culture that they live in, right? Mm -hmm. So they self-diagnose as there's a problem here and that's the reason that they come in for coaching. But usually what actually we're working on is again, self-awareness other awareness and communication between partners and then creativity, right? Because again, if we're so focused on sex has to look this way or intercourse, it's, you know, it's about this. Like when we are, when we don't have access to all of that creativity, it's almost like when you're in fight or flight mode and you get sort of like tunnel vision and you're just so focused on this one thing, right? And you mm -hmm. forget that everything else exists. Like you're overly focused on the problem or the argument or whatever it is. Like there's so much more that's available, but unless you have somebody to help you get that perspective and back out and like regulate so you don't feel like you're gonna die when you're thinking about this, mm -hmm. it, when we have access to all of that creativity, that's where good communication comes from. That's when we can like really pause and like go, oh, does this really turn me on? Or have I just been told that this should turn me on and it's not working for me? So I think there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. Really, like there's nothing wrong with you. Mm. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I mean, it's like you have to unpack so many, so much emotional baggage, right? To get at like the core of what the problem might be. Totally. And you know what? Sex is something that happens naturally in your body, right? It's just like digestion. Mm -hmm. You don't have to think about how to digest your food. You can learn a lot about food itself, how to make food, what kind of food your body like appreciates the most, like what, 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 like rebalancing your diet and getting the right nutrients and all that. And you should learn about food just the same way that you should feel free to learn about sex if it's something that's not happening naturally. But one once you get the ingredients right and you know what you're putting into your body, your body does the rest of the work. And sex mm -hmm. is the same. We're, we're designed to do it. It's the single most important thing that we do as a species. Our entire evolution is based on getting us to mate better and produce better offspring. That is how sexual reproduction works. So when we clear up all of that other stuff, sex happens like really, really naturally. Yeah. I mean, why do you think that the world is generally so afraid of something that comes so naturally to us and is like necessary to procreate and continue the human race. Okay, how, I mean, can I really answer that question and, and how would I really think it is about yeah. it? So, so the way that I see it is that that comes down to organized religion, really. Mm -hmm. um, and Sex is the only human need that we have that you won't literally die without. So water, shelter, food, air, all the other basic needs, they all lead to re procreation, but you have to get you know past puberty to even be able to procreate. So we need all of these other things first. And without air and water and food, you'll literally die. But without sex, you won't die on a physical level. You might die on an emotional or a spiritual level, but your body will continue on, right? And so what organized religion has done for the past couple thousand years is tell people that that human need that you have is not a real need. And it, having that need alone makes you bad, dirty, and wrong. And therefore, you need to come to church. You need to come to synagogue. You need to come to mosque to repent or pay for that need that's not really a need, right? Because like it's just that's Satan moving through you or that sin moving through you or whatever. So what it does is it has tricked people into thinking that this thing that is very core to who we are, it evolved through us, that is like a just a standard issue human need that every single one of us has in one way or another, makes us bad, dirty, wrong, and shameful. And that justifies why we need to continue to go to the church or to continue to tithe or continue to repent or continue to confess because how else would you convince people to do something that isn't always in their best interest? Uh, you need to give them. You need to like give them something that makes them think that there's something wrong. There's something broken about them. But you couldn't do that with like say hunger, right? You couldn't convince people that like because you feel hunger, you're broken because mm -hmm. it just doesn't. Like, we would it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm thinking of like the original sin thing with exactly. Adam and Eve, which like blows my. Mind. So I was raised as an atheist, right? So 
religion is really strange to me. Um, and I remember like originally learning about the original sin thing. I'm like, so wait a minute, you're born like a bad person and you got to spend the rest of your life trying to like be a good person by like praying to this entity who like wants to send you to burn in hell right. if you don't like say that he's the best all the time. And like this it, isn't like on earth is bad like you mean the place where we can like eat delicious food and have orgasms this isn't heaven there's something but we need to suffer through this yeah so that we can go to somewhere better later but like if we open our mind and allow pleasure to exist here like this is this is the best right like yeah. like yeah human experience is also suffering and, and difficulty and like let's not knock that but ultimately like there's pleasure available to all of us all of the time in all kinds of different ways like it when anything that has to be like convinced to you or sold to you over and over and over again i keep passing by this billboard in hollywood that goes like in the beginning god created and it has like a little x through like the monkey to man kind of oh, thing right? right and i just keep thinking like big dogs don't have to bark you know you don't have to take out billboards to convince something to convince people of something that is true yeah. Right. You have to take out billboards to convince something of like to people that, that that doesn't actually resonate with them. And you have to keep hammering that home generation after generation after generation. Like if this were true, we probably wouldn't need to continue to be reminded of it. Yeah. And I mean, it just like everything else, like with the human condition just comes into control. Right. It's control. Yeah. Yeah. It's population control. Right. Yeah. And I think that you can't control people through a variety of other means, but you definitely can control them if you tell them that something that occurs naturally for them makes them wrong or broken and that there's an answer out there that is going to fix it. Yeah. 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 No, that's scary. I think about women like specifically and how women are sex shamed all the time. And I think about, you know, how that I th I'm sure was enacted initially. I mean, obviously men are sex shamed too, but women specifically, you said population control, right? Because it's like you can't have, because women unfortunately get, have to bear children. Like they have a physical like representation of like having sex, right? right? That can occur. And if it right. occurs in an unwanted way, it can be a problem. But, you know, since the advent of birth control, like we can control that and we can take like our power back we can take our sexual power back we don't you know all of these things that were initially like a problem for women like sleeping around like not a problem not anymore problem but anymore. we can't shed that shame and fear around it and isn't that why abortion rights have come up in this country over the last several years and why that's such a big political issue today yeah. I mean, even with the missouri clinic and the ivf and embryos being seen as people like yeah this is on the surface, of course, everyone says this is about life, but actually it is about controlling women. Yeah. And I think like if we were to get just I'll say this much, I think the current climate in the U.S. around men and masculinity is men feel very disempowered. A lot of the jobs that men used to have and like the purpose, the, the things that gave them worth, like going off and fending for your country or like going to the uh, uh, factory and making something that you could like hold at the end of the day. That, you could get a pension and you can afford a house. And you could afford you a house. And you get family. And, yes, exactly. Like Do all that these anymore. things that gave men yeah. a sense of worthiness are are dwindling in the United yeah. States. And instead of focusing on like the actual sources for that, like uh, outsourcing of jobs and, you know, just the driving towards capitalism, like the endless kind of uh, uh, greed and, and uh, 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 hoarding of wealth at the top, they blame women. Yeah. Right. It's like women's fault. Like we went in and took their factory jobs. Like the jobs don't just exist anymore. Right. Like we're the reason that they can't afford houses or why they can't mate or why they don't have the intimate touch or the physical touch that they really, really desire. And really, it's like it pits us against each other when it's not men versus women. Like there's there's way bigger forces at hand that none of us had any control over. All of us were born into. And the more that we fight against each other, the more that like the red pill movement or the black pill movement, like the manosphere gains hold. And this is like very misogynistic rhetoric. Like we're all missing that the real point. Yeah. 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 I feel like well, it's so, so funny. deep over but here. No, I know. But it's really funny because literally everything you said is like stuff that my husband and I talk about. And he's like 100% on your side. Like my, I love my husband. He's such a feminist. And like, I just feel like I just like, and we were talking about this last night and he gave me so much anxiety because we were talking about my daughter. I have a three-year-old and he was like, do you realize like that it's possible that our daughter won't have any fucking rights when she's older? Like 
you know, this country and the election coming up. And I literally could not sleep last night. Oh, I'm sorry. Because like, I know. I think I'm like, this- can we not talk about abortion rights like right before bed, honey? Like you're killing me. And, good boundary. Good boundary. You know? Good boundary to set. And he's yeah, like, yeah. he takes his weed gummies. He's like, oh, and I'm just in bed like this. Oh my God. Oh my God. Also, the we've got a, shit. There's a long time before we have to think about that for her in particular, but it, it is true that all of us should be thinking about this every single day. Yeah. And I, you know, this is one of those issues where I'm like, yeah, I'm a single issue voter, like my control over my body and my ability to, and, and not just mine, but like all, all bodies that can get pregnant. Mm-hmm. Like when we just don't have that basic autonomy and like having a child is, you know, like is one of the biggest life changing decisions that one could ever possibly make yes. when you take control over that away from people. Like, I, I recently made a YouTube video where I'm like, I don't want to give butt licking tips anymore if people can't have sex without being concerned about having an unwanted pregnancy. Like, what is the point of teaching people how to get amazing at in bed and give epic amounts of pleasure to each other if sex could result in something that changes the course of your life and takes all of your power away? Yeah. 100%. I mean, I'll still make butt licking videos, but <laughs> I, they'll be different. You know? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I waited till I was 40 to have a kid and I'm so grateful that I did that because I was able to have a child at a place at a time in my life where I could afford to, I felt like emotionally stable, I had found the right partner, like all of these things and I feel like that really set me up to be a good mother. Yeah. And give my child like the best life that she could have. Right. Like if I had gotten pregnant 20 years ago, like I could not say the same. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's not about like not wanting children it's about controlling the moment in our life when we want to have children or or also not having children it can also be about that too which is fine and it's about giving women the freedom to engage in sex you know i think coming back to the idea of control women's bodies are sexual appetites are orgasmic potential like women are really sexual creatures yeah. not more or less than men but like all, we we have an inherent like voraciousness about us sort of sexually and i think that's really scary to to uh, acknowledge um, and, you know, when we live inside of a society that seeks to control women and sort of, you know, keep them in the, their place, whatever that looked like from 40 years ago, or whatever we made up in the 1950s, mm-hmm. like the women's sexuality is actually really scary, but it also is really desired, right? Like men really want women to be like sexually unleashed and wild, but like only under really controlled settings, right? Mm-hmm. And acknowledging that like women are inherently very sexual and inherently can be sexually unleashed is terrifying. Yeah. And so instead of giving us freedom to control that, it's like, well, you just take away their freedom and punish them for having sex. And that's really like what the abortion conversation comes down to is like, you should not have had sex to begin with. And therefore this is on you and you have to deal with the consequences. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're gonna take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we're gonna talk about butt licking. I promise, I promise. <laughs> Stick around. We'll be right back. Lickety split. This episode of Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by Adam and Eve. Who wants better sex? And who wants to start having better sex immediately? The best way to get started is to go to adamandeve.com right now, the online superstore for everything sexy. They are offering 50% off of any one item. Plus, when you select your one item, you will also get three special bonus gifts that includes an item for him, a special toy for her, and something we know you'll both enjoy. Also, get six free movies and free discreet shipping. But you can only get the special offer when you go to adamandeve.com and use code HOLLY. So be sure to use code HOLLY to get your 50% discount, 10 free gifts, and free shipping today. Hello, everybody. Okay, we are back. So um, my next question for Caitlin is not specifically about butt licking. I know I promised butt licking, but I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to ask her about something else, though, that I know you guys are really interested in, and that is a premature ejaculation. Mm -hmm. That is something that I hear a lot of guys have issues with. So I know you've talked a lot about that. Do you think it's an issue that more men than you may think struggle with? Yeah, totally. Uh, the research says that one in three men at least will deal with it at some point in their lifetime. And that could be underreported, right? Because it's an issue that people experience shame around, right? And it's not something that they want to talk about. They want to talk about. And, we, you know, when it comes to erectile dysfunction, we have pills for that, right? And so there's money to be made on erectile mm-hmm. dysfunction. But premature ejaculation, you know, they sell numbing sprays, which I am vehemently against these numbing sprays mm-hmm. just because it's a band-aid solution right like okay so it works this time but like what about next time right yeah uh and that's if it works this time but 
the reason that I got into premature ejaculation is I made this video that went viral on YouTube about squirting, right? And so thousands of men started coming to me who wanted help with premature ejaculation. And the reason they were interested in squirting is because they thought it was like going to help them to provide something that that would like shock and astonish and make them a very memorable and like make them, uh, uh, you know, the best lover she's ever had, even if they couldn't last long enough to please her through penetration. Mm -hmm. And so I came from this world of research to all of a sudden being like launched into premature ejaculation. And because I'm a researcher by nature, I didn't like, you know, I hit the books and I saw like, what's the current, you know, how do, how do people treat this in sex therapy? And I just was like, this is very uninspiring. This feels like old and antiquated and kind of like dusty. Mm -hmm. And so I started experimenting with my clients and giving like one, this kind of assignment or that kind of assignment and tweaking the way that they were masturbating or tweaking the, the way that they were breathing or giving them different pelvic floor exercise routines and just kind of like throwing everything at the wall to see what stuck. And over the course of five years, I came up with a method, which I call my come when you want method. And it combines the body, the emotions, the mental game, uh, even spirituality, even the relationship itself to have like a holistic perspective because premature ejaculation ultimately is really caused by tension and anxiety, right? The pressure to perform, mm -hmm. which you could talk about, you know, again, people comparing porn to their sex life, yeah. right? And thinking that they need to be able to perform in this way, gets them stuck in their head, increases the amount of tension and anxiety that they feel in their body. And orgasm is the pleasurable release of tension. So when you come into sex and you're already super tense, you're like already that much closer to orgasming, right? And then men really, you know, to, to come back to the way that we masturbate, a lot of men masturbate or grow up masturbating as quickly as possible right? Because they're afraid that they're going right. to get walked in on, right? Like mom's going to come into the bathroom yeah. or I'm going to get caught watching porn on my you know, phone or computer for the younger generation. Older guys uh, didn't have that privilege. But we train ourselves, right? The way that we have sex with ourselves is the way that we're going to have sex with a partner. And so when you train yourself to orgasm as quickly as possible when you're alone, you're going to bring that into the bedroom with you. And unfortunately, there's so much shame and stigma around this. A lot of guys just avoid having sex altogether, or they come up with these sort of like stopgap measures where they're like, well, I'll just be able to go two or three times in a night. Well, that might work while you're in your 20s or even your 30s for a little bit, but there's going to be a point in which you just your refractory period is too much that you can't just go multiple rounds in a night. So and also, like sometimes the girl doesn't want multiple times in a night. I never. Like, yeah, no, yeah, we so want like, one, and I'm done. Like yeah. I'm tired. I want to go to bed. Like well, and we can talk about delayed ejaculation, which is on the other side, which is also on the rise, right? Which is guys that can't reach orgasm, yeah. and I'm seeing more and more men. I mean, I think the numbers on this are really underreported because mm -hmm. I think it's like one in ten or two in ten men deal with delayed ejaculation, but that is on the rise too. And again, it also, I think, is because of the way that people masturbate. So again, coming back to porn, I think a lot of guys like kind of desensitize themselves because mm -hmm. maybe they watch porn for like four or five hours and they edge the whole time. And they're again, they're like kind of training their body not to reach orgasm. And then when they're with a partner, they're taking that into the bedroom as well. Mm -hmm. Or they're just kind of desensitized because mm -hmm. like being with one woman like in your, the quiet of your own home yeah. can be kind of boring. Who wants that? wants that right really gang bangs and <laughs> you know like but seriously i i, I feel like i'm finding that a lot also in my own like personal life it's just like i'm i'm finding that like all the men that i'm talking to like friends and lovers are like yeah i just can't reach orgasm anymore yeah with a partner yeah interesting yeah interesting so so but you find that a lot of your work right now resides in premature ejaculation that's kind of the number one thing that my YouTube channel and my work has really been tackling. And mm -hmm. then and then I kind of took that method and brought that into um, erectile dysfunction and delayed ejaculation later. Right. But yeah, PE is still my kind of calling card. Right. One of the questions that I get a lot from my male audience is also how to please a woman, right? I mean, you spoke briefly just now about like being that memorable lover and maybe even using that to, you know, hide the fact that you're, you know, coming earlier than you would like to. Um, so yoni massage, I believe, is something that yeah. kind of like plays into that opportunity. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So yoni massage is this incredible practice. It comes, it, it comes just based in tantra and sort of the ancient art of uh, spiritual sexuality. But I have taken it and kind of modernized it um, in in. The work that I've been doing recently. So essentially yoni is the Sanskrit, Sanskrit word for sacred space and it refers to the vulva and vagina, but actually it's like kind of the, the, the whole of the female anatomy, right? Mm -hmm. And a yoni massage is a really particular practice that a lover can give to a woman or a woman can give to herself uh, that, that 
massages all of the different parts of the anatomy and it can be very healing and it can be very pleasurable. And the reason this is so important is that one in five women has pain with sex. It's like this, this is an outrageous number. If one of when if one in five women had pain like while they were driving their car, I think this would be like an epidemic, right? Like we would all be like really focused on like what's going on with seatbelts or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. If one in five women had pain like, you know, every time they wore heels, like there would be a conversation that we would be having about shoes. But one in five women have pain with sex. Again, we've established that this is like a very natural, important thing for our bodies if we if we desire to have it. And yoni massage helps to do a few things. It helps for uh, a woman to get out of this, like uh, get a, get away from the relationship that she may have with her vulva or her vagina that is one of shame or one of expectation. I should be orgasming. I should be wet. I should be enjoying sex. Like, and gets back into like this is just a part of your body that can be treated with love and care and compassion and reverence and actually treated like a very sacred part of your body. And that, you know how when you get a massage and you're just kind of, you're not in giving mode, you're just in receiving, right? Ideally, you're just kind of like relaxed and mm-hmm. and you're, you're letting your muscles be worked out and released and like allow healing to come to the body. Yoni massage is the same idea. It also just happens to have this like very erotic, very intimate component to it because it can feel really, really good. In the course that I made on Yoni Massage, I gave two Yoni Massages to real women, um, one of whom is a a porn star. She works in porn. She's a doll entertainer. And her massage was really about healing. Like not that there was anything significant. She's she's had a child through vaginal delivery. Like she's got a working pussy. Like, Mm -hmm. Like she just like, you know, any of us that stand on our feet all day, like a foot massage feels great, right? Uh, and then the other one I gave to a friend of mine who's like very orgasmic. She's just like super turned on throughout the whole massage. She's like, it's just like a juicy ass massage. And so <laughs> we got to see like that they can be used for like two very, very different things. And for women, like, you know, so much of the sexual expectations on us can be sort of like to enjoy and perform and be loud and orgasmic. And, the, and, and this kind of like takes that away and allows us to just like have a body, have it be touched, have it be explored and give it like a significant amount of time and attention in order to like really bloom. You know, one of the major things that happens to women and causes that pain with sex is that we end up being penetrated prematurely. Like not a lot, myself included. I'm I'm like, let's get in there. I'm eager, I'm enthusiastic, like let's get to it. But you know, really if we're warming our bodies up properly, we could spend between 20 and 40 minutes just getting turned on enough to have penetration. And think about also like the pelvic floor of a woman, the muscles that make up the vaginal opening are muscles. Like we wouldn't just jump into a marathon without stretching, right? We would expect that that would kind of tear up our legs and cause us to have pain and maybe injury over time. But we don't think about the vagina in the same way. Well, well adult entertainment porn stars do, right? Like mm-hmm. they do warm ups before they, 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 perform because they know that their body needs to be conditioned in order to stretch, in order to be able to take, you know, anything really, but like, especially things that are particularly large Mm -hmm. uh, through penetration. And so Yoni Massage gives us like a whole world that that is able to tackle all of those things and improve the connection between partners, improve orgasmic potential, and just improve pleasure and health in general. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting what you said about women having pain when they have sex and that the yoni massage kind of focuses on that i had an ex who i was having pain with when we had sex and i remember going to the doctor um and i was like told him like look this is the problem like i don't know what to do and i think i had been to like a separate gynecologist before him because i was with this person for a while and (laughs) this doctor sits down and he said something to me which was so unexpected and now looking back i'm like my god he really understood he sits down and he goes well there's nothing wrong with your body we've checked it all this stuff your vagina is fine do you actually like this person and like and i didn't i had been trying to get out of that relationship for a long time it's very complicated and i was like uh no <laughs> yep and he was like i think your body <laughs> Is literally rejecting yeah. this person and that's why you're having the pain there's right. nothing wrong with you physically but like mentally yeah there's a lot yeah the body on. doesn't lie you can't override the body yeah right like, like you can Damn. override your mind and be yeah. like no 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 but i need to stay because this and like maybe there are really good reasons to stay in a bad relationship yeah. right like yeah. you, financially you can't or whatever but like yeah. your body you can't trick yeah. Nope. yeah and erections are the same too actually yeah. it's just instead of pain usually like they won't work right. right they just won't be able to get hard and it's the body just going like i'm not going in there 
Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I just remember that really, like, I've never forgotten that. That had such an impact on me. And oh, it what was a great the, that mind-body connection was really apparent to me in that moment. Right. And I had never thought about that. Yeah. Or, you know, one of the things that happens is women, and, and men too, we are very sensitive, right? Mm-hmm. Like, not all of us, but, but certainly a, a larger number of us than we actually acknowledge are very, very sensitive. But what happens when you're very sensitive and then sex kind of happens, like, too fast and you don't know that you can slow it down or that you can ask for different things is that in order to protect your sensitive uh, uh, being, like, both physically and emotionally, we put on armor. And so when we armor our bodies and we armor our pussies, they get, like, tight and they squeeze and like they literally like put up armor and then when we continue to have intercourse that pushes past that armor over time it's just like your your body gets injured over and over again and actually all we really need to do is slow way the f down Mm -hmm. and come at the body and come at the 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 spirit and the mind as well like way slower and mm-hmm. appreciate like the role of tease and anticipation and like slow buildups. But again, that's just not what we've been taught because all we've been taught is like how not to get pregnant and yeah. pass STDs. Like, yeah. <laughs> Have you ever thought about why nature has, I guess, programmed men to get hard quickly and be ready to go right away and women take like 20 minutes? You know, I think like that just feels yeah. really unfair and like against Darwinism. Well, and why know. it programmed men to ejaculate too soon and too frequently. Yeah. Right? Like because we talked about how frequently premature ejaculation impacts men. Yeah. And it's not just masturbation. It's because evolutionarily, who was more likely to pass on their seed? It was the guy who came really fast. Yeah. You know, the, who's like as soon as he started having sex, he was in and out. Right. Like yeah. that, that that actually benefited you. So you're more likely to pass those those okay. genetics that on. That makes sense. Um, yeah, all of all of my answers for that come back to like a really spiritual bend. Like I think that sex is just this kind of cool I think it's like access to to the oneness, right? Mm-hmm. Like this has really come for me recently because again I came from research. So then I'm today I'm like a coach and I, I'm very like woo woo about it. Yeah. But again, it's like I, I I it took me a long time to get here. But I think that sex actually is kind of designed to connect us to something bigger than ourselves. I think that's why when you have really great sex and really great orgasms and like you just kind of feel like you you lose yourself in it for the moment and you you take part in or like taste something that's like way bigger and beyond you. And I think women's bodies are just programmed to be able to do that. And men's bodies evolved to just mate essentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, and this is in every species, but in the human species as well, because we reproduce sexually, men are a little more expendable, right? Like uh, just on a biological level, we don't, men, women need to exist so that we can continue the species, but you can have the same man reproduce with multiple women. Like the, the, the reality of the situation is that it's very costly to produce male offsprings because they don't procreate for the species. Mm -hmm. And so I think that our bodies just have evolved super differently because of the needs that we provide because of the the role that we have in human evolution and Mm in um, continuing the species. So, and that's why they say that if a woman orgasms during sex, she's more likely to get pregnant. Yeah, totally. So interesting. Yeah. Yeah. We were designed for pleasure at the end of the day, all of us really. Yeah. Um, If one partner is more sexually adventurous than the other, how can you still be a supportive partner, even if some things that they're interested in are too far past what you're willing to do? Mm. So there are these wonderful things online. You can find them called yes, no, maybe lists. Mm. And they tend to list, you know, between like 20 and 100 or 500. I made one once. um, Different options that we could explore in intimacy and in the bedroom and even outside of it. One of the greatest things that you can do with this is have both partners go through and say yes to the things that they're really interested in, no to the things that are hard now, and maybe to the things that they might be willing to explore. Because this is going to open up again, coming back to this idea of sexual creativity, when you have 400 options or 100 options on a list and you get to choose between those that sound kind of interesting to you, you might find that there's a lot more overlap than you think there is. Yeah. Maybe like one partner is like, I want to get super kinky and like we need spreader bars and a dog cage in the bedroom. And the other person is like, I maybe a blindfold. Um, <laughs> maybe we could start with like a, a gentle, you could tie your your tie around my wrist or something like that right but we need to be able to find those areas where the two of us can like move closer and closer to each other right and i think you know you have to have willingness on both partners right because 
if you have one partner that's really adventurous and the other partner is just not willing to go there, that's different than that they have just different interests, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Both partners have to be willing to like come up to a, a, an agreement and explore together. Mm -hmm. But again, if you don't have a very nuanced view of sex and relationships, then how are you going to find that stuff that appeals to both people? Like I teach a system called the erotic blueprints. Um, and I've been alluding to it a little bit throughout this podcast, but the blueprints are essentially energetic, which are people that are turned on by tease and anticipation and super sensitive and they can have full body orgasms with like out even being touched. Sensual, people that are turned on by their five senses, sight, sounds, tastes, smells. They have a really high tolerance for pleasure, but they also tend to get stuck in their head and orgasms can just like disappear. Or they can get stuck thinking about the grocery list. So they need like a lot of physical sensation. The sexual blueprint is people who are turned on by like orgasms and naked bodies and genitals and they tend to be like super simple and just like they need sex they want sex they gotta know that sex is gonna happen this is what all of us have been conditioned to believe that we are right but not all of us actually get turned on in that way mm -hmm. and then the kinky blueprint which is people who are turned on by anything that's taboo and it's like mm -hmm. what's taboo to you what's mm -hmm. taboo to me is going to be very different than what's taboo to you than what's taboo to a listener and it can be psychological or physical uh physical taboo like bondage or restraints or whips and chains but mm -hmm. also like daddy little girl play or like nurse doctor play whatever like anything yeah. that feels taboo and then the fifth is a shapeshifter and that's someone who has all four of the other blueprints and needs to express themselves in all four of the other blueprints and the reason i come back to the erotic blueprints is like when one person has some like really extreme out there desires and interests if we can can if we can kind of label them by what blueprint this is in is it kinky because it's taboo or is it sensual because i really love the feel of leather is it uh is it sexual because it's just straightforward and like needs meeting kind of sex or is it more about the uh, emotional and mental and spiritual connection once we start having this language to describe and actually uh, communicate around why that particular thing would meet our needs then we can start building bridges because i can understand why i'm turned on and what my blueprint is what your blueprint is and we can talk about where they actually can meet mm -hmm. okay yeah i know that makes sense um, so my last question for you is right here. <laughs> if there was just one thing that you could get people to learn about sex and sexuality, what would that be? Come on, sum it up in sum one word. In one <laughs> sum up all your years of research in one word. <laughs> I would say no such thing as normal. Mm. Yeah. I, okay. think, I think if I was to sum it up, I would say that, you know, it, eroticism is a birthright it's something that all of us came here with even if you're asexual like you can still experience like the the joy and the pleasure that comes from eroticism without it needing to be like about your genitals but like ultimately there is no such thing as normal and you're not broken no matter what you are comparing yourself to or how you think you need to be performing or what turns you on or doesn't turn you on like we have this idea that there's like a way that sex should look and work in the world mm -hmm. and it's just it's just so unique. It's like, yeah. just like your digestion or, you know, the way that you like to sleep with your pillow at that one angle or whatever, like the way that your skin doesn't like light in this way. Like we're just all unique little beings. Yeah. And so there's no such thing as normal. As long as what you're into doesn't hurt anybody and it supports you and your well being. like, fuck yeah for being into it. Like go out, like express yourself, enjoy yourself. Life is short, have orgasms and don't compare yourself to what you think things ought to be yeah that's a t-shirt right there life is short have orgasms amen i mean that's that's your new motto i'm giving that to you <laughs> that's the tagline of our show where we, we critique people's yes sex videos. yes yes <laughs> life is short have orgasms but also make sure they're lit well <laughs> Well, Caitlin, thank you so much for coming on. I feel like we could talk for a whole other hour because I know that you're like a wealth of sexual information. Um, I do have a couple more questions um, that my Patreon members sent me that um, I'm going to ask you in a little bonus segment. But for now, can you let everybody know where they can find you online, where they can find your online courses and where they can learn more from you? So you can find me on YouTube at Caitlin V. And I have a special gift for all of the listeners of Holly Randall Unfiltered. It is a free guide, three techniques to wow her. You can download that at boostinbed.com slash Holly. And once you do, we actually have a second free gift for you, which is a discount on my Yoni massage course that Holly and I spoke about during the show. And if you want that, again, boostinbed.com slash Holly. 
And you guys can find me on Instagram at Holly Randall and on Twitter at the same. Go to patreon.com to access episodes like this streaming live as well as the bonus Q&A that we're about to do. And definitely make sure that you visit Caitlin's site and um, get your free gift because, uh, you know, sex should be enjoyed and she's here to help you with that. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you next week.